I'm Shachar Razani and welcome to this JBS special coming to you all the way from Northern Israel. We have the pleasure of being hosted at the Tefen Industrial Park in the offices of the Alma Research and Education Center. We are here with our very well-known and familiar Sarit Zahavi. She is the founder and CEO of the Alma Education Center and she's a frequent visitor, not just to the US on various conferences, but also right here on JBS and other media outlets sharing her insights on the geopolitics of the Middle East, ranging from Iran, Syria, Lebanon, and of course, Israel. Sarit, thank you so much for hosting us right here at the Alma offices, your home. You are most welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so, you know, we, we speak often about issues that are, you know, in the news and relevant, uh, what's happening around. I want to take this opportunity and get to know Sarit Zahavi, because the story of Israel is very much the story of the entrepreneurial zeal of the women who compose not just the land of Israel, but specifically this region of the Galilee. Mm -hmm. So we'd love to hear, first of all, about yourself, where do you live, a little bit about your family, an opportunity to hear the person behind, behind those extensive and very impressive reports <laughs> that you produce. Wow, uh, where should I start? Uh, actually, I'm a lieutenant colonel in reserve. I served for about uh, 16 years in the Israel Defense Forces. I was an intelligence officer, I was an analyst. I got all the information to my computer, I wrote the reports. I dreamt to deal with the Middle East and to try to understand better the Middle East since I was 16 years old. Wow. Um, back then, it was uh, the Oslo Accords and it was the whole issue of uh, peace agreements between Israel and its neighbors right, and Syria, Golan. Uh, was this when you were in the army? Even, and even before, when, when I was in high school and I studied Middle East uh, and Arabic in high school and then I, uh, after my service, I ended my service and went back to service. So in between, I studied AMA in Middle Eastern studies and I knew this is what I want to do. I want to kind of develop a different point of view uh, of the Middle East after I experienced the academic point of view and I experienced the, you know, the army, the military point of view and I wanted to develop something else because I was actually not satisfied with any of them. And I think that I was blessed. It's, by the way, pause me, it's so Israeli. You know, you don't like this and you don't <laughs> like that, so you created. This is the entrepreneurial zeal of the startup nation. Uh, yes, I, I, look, you know, it's, a good friend once told me that it's, the success is a combination of a very supportive environment, a little bit of luck, and a lot of hard work. And I think that I was blessed to meet the people that wanted to help me and invest in this uh, project named the Alma Center. By the way, uh, Alma is my little girl that was born when I left right. the army. Somebody <laughs> whispered in my ear, they said, you know, Alma is her baby. <laughs> so they meant it literally. Baby of today, right. she is nine years old, but she is definitely the boss in the family, in the blended family that we right. have created. It's his, mine and ours. It's five children in total that are, except for Alma, all of them are grown up now, you know, around their service in the army. And uh, I, I'm, I'm really feeling blessed that I could, uh, you know, uh, fulfill the dream. So, you know, before that dream, I just want to ask you, you are a strong woman. You live here in the Galilee, but in your family, there are also some very strong women with yeah. interesting background. Share with us a little bit of that story. Where should I start? Um, Wherever you want. Okay. On my father's side, my grandmother, Miriam, was born in Beirut. Beirut. Her father in World War I uh, got sick. He had difficulties in breathing. And the doctors suggested him to go to Ale, which is not far from the Beirut in Lebanon, to the mountains for vacation. And he took his wife and a child and another one of my uh, grandmother's sisters. She was a baby. And they went there. And in the middle of the night, there was a knocking on the door and uh, somebody asked in Arabic, are you Christians? And the nanny who was Christian said, yes, we are. And the door was open and somebody uh, took off a, a rifle and shot, down, shot everybody and killed everybody, except for the little baby, my grandmother's sister. And actually five sisters remained orphans and they grew up with the uncles in Beirut. And uh, very quickly the uncles wanted to marry them, like to have a joy in the family. 
So my grandmother was married to a rich jeweler in Damascus. That's actually the source for my family name, Zahavi, which actually it's Hebrewizing of uh, the word um, a jeweler in Arabic. And then Zahavi, Zahavi means gold in Hebrew. So she went to Damascus. My father was born 1945. My father was 11 years old. And there were riots in Damascus. And he was born in Damascus. He was born in so Damascus. So your connection to Lebanon and Syria is quite a family connection. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how it turned out to right. be, you know, everything connected. It's all in the family. But all in the family, eventually. And yes, he was born in Damascus. And in 1945, there were riots in Damascus. The Arabs were fighting against the French. And the, Fra the Jews, the Jewish community of Damascus was affiliated with the French. My father studied in a French school, Alliance. It was a net of Jewish schools that the French right. established. He, he, he spoke in, you know, when, when his mother, when my grandmother wanted to call him, she didn't say Musa or Moshe. She would say Moise in French. Wow. And uh, in 1945, it became more and more dangerous, and the, the feeling was very insecure in the Jewish community of Damascus, while the emissaries of the Haganah uh, succeeded after a lot of beggings, the Jewish agency to enable them to at least rescue the children, to at least bring the children. And my father came to my grandmother, and he told her, let me go, my teacher was just murdered. I want to go to the land of Israel. I don't want to stay here anymore. Now my grandmother has a had a dilemma because my grandfather already left for Israel for a business trip before all the trouble started. He took with him two, uh, two of his children. My grandmother was to stay alone in a big house in Damascus with the two uh, elderly grandparents and two babies that she had and to send her two boys in the middle, my father and his brother, to the land of Israel. And in times there were no cell phones, wow, you know, no WhatsApp. Right, right. And she hardly knew what is Israel. And eventually she sent them away. And she and always. And she stayed? She stayed uh, with the two babies. And she always tells me about Shabbat dinner. Uh, j just after they went away. And the old grandfather uh, told her, Call Moise, I want him to take me to the synagogue. And she said, uh, Moise left for the land of Israel. And he was really angry with her. How did you do that? How did you let him go? And only after he died, which were a few months later probably, my grandmother took her two babies, went to Beirut. She always told us that she left the, everything on the stove so nobody will know that she is leaving. She left everything behind. She just took a bag with few jewelries to bribe the guards in the borders. She arrived to Beirut to meet her family and from there she crossed the border into Israel. And it took her two years to find her two sons that were uh, sent to different kibbutz in Israel. Wow, so what it's a story. Like an unbelievable story. On my mother's <coughs> side, it's a story that I learned like along the years, along the years my grandmother told me that she grew up in Jerusalem and she didn't tell us too much. And only after she died, her brother came and told us that actually she was born in Hebron. Wow. And in the massacre in Hebron in 1929, she was a little girl of seven years old. And there were just two children in the family and a Muslim family hid them and rescued them. Wow. And right afterwards, they were expelled from Hebron by the British and they went to Jerusalem. A few years later, riots started in Jerusalem and they tried to leave and to Beirut and they, there was a hunger in Beirut, so they went back. So also with my grandmother, you know, there is a story. And my mother was already born in Tel Aviv and they always say, uh, she always said, what, I have a birth certificate that it's written government of Palestine. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, so, you know, um, I, I can say that both my parents uh, raised me that there is no other way but Zionism. You know, there is no other way but actually also, living here and serving the state of Israel. And also, I think what we're hearing from you here is how well rooted you are and your family is in this land because many a time the voices who are anti-Israel claim that you know Jews are nothing but colonizers they're not connected to this land and just listening to you is to understand the threads that weave Jewish history throughout the Middle East from Lebanon to Syria to Israel and beyond and that in and of itself I think is a, a huge message of the fact that you're here doing what you're doing. 
my father always denied the stories that Jews lived perfectly in the, in the Middle East before Zionist movement, etc. Right, when these I, are the claims, right? These that are the claims. Supposedly before Zionism, Jews, you know, they were living in golden ages throughout the Middle East and in harmony with the Muslim community. You know, they didn't have anything to compare to. <laughs> you know what I'm right. saying? Yeah. So yes, in the, maybe in the personal uh, level, there were good connections, but eventually they didn't feel, uh, at least I can say about Damascus, they didn't feel completely equal and co completely at home and com right. completely secure. And when I grew up, I learned that actually in the end of the 19th century, there were already riots against the Jews in Damascus. There was, the, the name was Damascus Plot. The Jews were blamed for, I don't know, something. Right. And, and, and there were riots. So, you know, there were ups and downs. But as, as my father always said, we always used to say next year in, in Jerusalem, even though Many of us didn't go to Jerusalem. The, most of the Jews uh, that lived in Syria eventually ended up uh, in the United States. They, all these years, eventually, there was a connection. The Jewish people kept the connection to this land of Israel. You cannot, you cannot ignore that, and definitely from my mother's side. Right, so this is not just um, a history textbook. This is life itself. You hear the testimony of your family. And here we are, fast forward. You're not happy with this, you're not happy with that, and mm -hmm. then here is the idea that comes to your mind to establish the Alma Research and Education Center. <laughs> what do you do? What's the first step? Um, How do you make this happen? This was also a, a process. Maybe the process is rooted in my service. Um, I was in the army during the war in 2006 uh, in Lebanon and right, the, second Lebanon, the war. second Lebanon war and part of my experience there was the whole issue of collateral da damage versus the human shield tactic. Right. Uh, the fact that there is a lot of uh, delegitimation of the state of, I the state right. of Israel and right. you know everything that was going out in the media that was kind of half the story all the time and I felt that we were fighting against that but it, it was like a lost war. And with these feelings, I, I went, I was assigned afterwards to the Northern Command. And during my service there, I met a lot of delegations that uh, came as, you know, uh, guests to the Northern Command, whether generals or diplomats or whoever wanted an intelligence briefing, <laughs> they kind of found me. And when I ended my service because of a medical problem, uh, I, I knew that this is what I want to do. I want to continue to brief the groups. I, I didn't imagine an institution like that. Did you do anything uh, in between or you immediately? I, no, immediately this is what I did, but it, at first it was a small business. Oh, that no, 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 I, I just have to understand. <laughs> yes, just for the entrepreneurs um, of us, the high schoolers who are watching this and want to know how to build lives, how to make your first profession. What's the first thing you did in making this happen? What was it? You decide you uh, want to do it, I get it. I opened it. my notebooks from the uh, study in the university and right. refreshed everything I study in the MA so I will be able to stand in front of the groups. So I, then you I, opened the business and you started I it, like... And I started training myself on those to briefings. be an expert because it's not enough to be a former expert. You right. need to be a present expert. I took right. Arabic lessons to refresh my Arabic. Uh, I opened a website which is not just to market the tours on the border, but also to write, to, to have a platform for uh, research, you know, to write articles because you, you cannot stand on the border and explain what's going on if you don't research. And you how many years ago was that? This was uh, nine years ago. Alma is nine years old. Nine years ago, <laughs> wow. When she was born. When she was a baby in the living room. I had to, to print business cards and I didn't know how to call my small business and she was there and I said, okay, <laughs> Alma is a nice name. <laughs> That's incredible. And you know, we're, we're right now, you know, out of that small business of, you know, just sharing information with delegations, you're hosting, what, dozens of groups? First, I must emphasize, it's not a business anymore. It's a non-profit organization because right. if you want to build uh, you know, a reliable and an in-depth uh, research de department, you cannot do that as a business. You right. need donations. Right. And when I understood that, immediately I closed the business and we established Alma Center as a non-profit organization, uh, which I'm very proud of today. You know, again, it was a gradual process. We started a little bit with searching for the information and hiring uh, people that can search faster than me in Arabic so social media. 
and then we brought a person that will help me with the so to publish in social media, not only on the website. And like in a gradual process, we, we establish this place that, as you can see, it is designed as a situation room. So we are right now at the situation room yes. of the Alma Education Research Center. We see the TV behind us. Tell us a little bit about what you do and dozens of groups a month. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Dozens of groups a month from various audiences and almost everywhere you can think of in the world. So you're saying that the interaction could be with army officials, diplomats and high school kids? Yes, students, journalists, uh, political leaders. So this is everything. a situation room. What does that mean? What's happening here? So after we are meeting them in the border and uh, we are briefing them on you know, true situation, what is happening, up to date, right. really up to date, background and up to date, you know, you need them both. Uh, they are coming in, in here and they are becoming Israelis, they are becoming the Israeli government because the whole idea is to create a simulation. Oh, so, so this is like a war game. It's kind of a war game. I don't like this term game because I take war it very, very game. seriously. Right. War is not a game. Uh, sometimes it's a stressing situation and the idea is that they will experience what it's like to be Israelis. So you present a certain scenario to them yes. and they fulfill different roles within that scenario mm -hmm. and they have to make real-time decisions as to the rolling situation. And then we bring, we show them like in breaking news what happened following their decisions, yes. Wow, that's impressive. Exactly. And how long does this exercise take? All in all, not, not including the briefing on the border, we are like half an hour from the border. We've been there, you saw. Right. Uh, it's an, around an hour and a half here, including the coffee and bathroom before. Oh. <laughs> and the war, the, the war exercise itself? That, that, that's an hour and a half. That's an hour and a half. It's, it's really, really rapid and, and quick. It was built, you know, specifically to these audiences that are coming here and they don't have too much time, but I truly don't want just to end it with a presentation. Right. It was important for me that people will be engaged right. and interactive. interactive. Yes, it was really important for so me. So I to have, have to that. ask you, um, for people who are not familiar with the complexities of the Middle East, with decision making in general, but specifically in complex situations like these, what have been some of the reactions you received for these um, war exercises so, that you've had? Oh, for the war exercise, I yeah. thought you were going to ask about the research. So, with your permission, I must tell you Let's something. Start. The yeah. biggest surprise we had here is that we find out that we create impact not only to English speakers. We publish everything in English. Right. But, uh, you know, we are now in an era that you have Google Translate. Right. And very quickly it became, uh, it goes to Arabic, it goes to Persian, and we started to receive like threats. Your reports? Yes, right. we don't translate that, right. but they use Google Translate probably to, to understand what we publish. Right. Maybe they know, I don't know. And then we get so threats from... So you publish from, in English? We publish in English. Right. We get threats from Hezbollah, we get cyber attacks from Iran. Uh, they, they, you know, send us the message, you know, we know who you are, you, we know your faces, you know where, we, where you are. Uh, they published Alma's uh, exact location and actually sent us a threat. Uh, wow. We know where you are. Uh, wow, they define us as the spine center of the Zionist entity that tries to intimidate Hezbollah. I'm quoting from one of the uh, articles that was published on Alma Center. And you know, I take that as a compliment. Of course, Alma Center is completely independent. I don't ask and I don't get any support from any government or any political party. But yet you are on the map. <laughs> the, the whole idea is to create an independent platform. Right. That Which is, is not what we love the most about you, because when we want the facts, and just the fact, so that we can make our own decisions and conclusions, that's where we go to. Yeah. And as for the simulation... Yes, yes I wonder, uh, because you know, I'm thinking to myself, uh, a high schooler in one of the uh, high schools in New York is not familiar with decision making, and especially on such situations. And then they come here, and they actually do mm -hmm. it. They actually do it. They are very much surprised by the complexity by the pressure of times and most of all by the fact that they don't know everything. Like we give them scenarios that they are missing pieces in this puzzle and you have to make decisions when you don't have all the information, which this is reality. 
and they are very, no, no way, how come? And, and they always tell me, Sarit, you made us choose between a bad option to a bad option. Sarit, is there, how come there are only two options? Is there a, th a third option? And, and they try really hard to, you know, to, to um, run away from a decision. And eventually they say, it was eye-opening, it was insightful, uh, or the youngest are saying, this was the coolest activity we yeah. had, or something like that. And again, the whole idea eventually is not to judge them or not to, you, you know, know what to I love see the most about this is this is tough material to cope with. It's not easy. It's, it's not really easy for materials. academic. It's not easy for adults. And here you are making it accessible. I'm making that accessible, but I think that what we brings them is what war is truly about, which they usually don't know. They don't understand that war for Israelis is very, very different, like war for Americans. And I give you the best example. When I was in the army, it was in the second Gulf War, and uh, we were waiting to attack to be open. And then at 2 a.m., we see in CNN, uh, America is at war, or something of the sort. Uh, there was no attacks in America. Right. Over here, if Israel is at war, rockets are falling outside of this window. It's on our heads. It's not miles away, you know, and I think this is the most important thing that they get when they get here. What is war right. for Israelis? Right. They really feel it. Yeah. And so the two main activities that uh, you conduct here would be the research and the education. Right. You so cannot you have, you have, you have, have the team. one without right. the other. Right. So you have the team of researchers yes. and then you, you take the information, you put out reports, you guide the different groups and you provide a better understanding of the situation for anyone from elected officials to, you know, high school children, students and others. Yes, definitely. You see the maps behind it. I believe that the picture worth a thousand words. The uniqueness of the research, uh, in opposed to many other think tanks, I don't know, in the United States and even in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, is the fact that we are looking for the small details, like we are doing that bottom up and from the small details of our, about the everyday life of the people on the other side, of how things look like, of some sometimes cross information between textual information to uh, terrain analysis, uh, you get the bigger picture. It's not that we are going for the leadership and what the leaders are saying and you know when they meet, we are less following that. We are following much more on the, the simple people just on the other side of the border. We spoke a lot today when we were at the border about Hezbollah military operatives. Are they there? They are not there. How they are dressed? How they... All of this uh, creates a picture, creates an understanding of who is out there and what are his uh, intentions. And we know that knowledge is power. <laughs> What's your vision for uh, the Alma Education and Research Center for the future? Um, the, vision, the vision is to have as many groups as possible, to reach out to as many audiences as possible, and at the same time to grow our online activities and social media So anybody exposure. who wants to follow up your reports, where do they go? They would go to Alma Center website, israel-alma.org, or we are everywhere on social media, uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram, TikTok, Tick Facebook. You're also on TikTok. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> Making uh, the Middle East accessible on TikTok in such an educational way. Why didn't they have it when I was younger? <laughs> Sarit, thank you so much for hosting us. This has been incredible. I learned a lot, and I'm sure our viewers did as well. And uh, we are able to keep in touch. We'll make sure to show and share. Um, I think the work that you do here is indispensable and the service you provide not just to Israel but to the world is appreciated and we will continue to happily enjoy your insights um, and, and your, the information that you're able to gather through research and share it with the world. We're really thankful for all of that what you do. You're an example of not just a, um, an academic entrepreneur but I dare say a social one. So kola kavod to you for the great work you do. Thank you very much, Shacha. Thank you very much. And thank you to our viewers. This has been an absolute joy to come here to the center of where everything happens and spend some precious time at the Alma Education and Research Center and to hear from Sarit Zahavi, not just about her incredible work, but also her incredible family. It runs in the family, it seems. <laughs> thank you all for watching. This has been a joy coming to you all the way from the Tefen Industrial Park in Northern Israel. We hope to see you soon. Shalom and Lehitraot for now.